Um, Chris Dodd, um, who was a Connecticut senator, got into some trouble uh, recently um, for basically letting it get out that he had complained that Kamala Harris, Senator Kamala Harris of California, was not contrite enough after her debate with former Vice President Joe Biden in which she got at him over his opposition to busing as a form as a tool for integration back when she was a kid and she tells this story about how she was the little girl that you know had to deal with that was in the middle of all of this fight right that you know busing in, impacted her you know my you know my sister also was was bust uh when she was going into the sixth grade which um actually going to seventh grade seventh grade used to be middle school and after sixth grade my sister got bust and that didn't last long it was so it was such an unpleasant experience they actually ended up canceling the whole busing thing and building us an entire school. It took a whole year to build it. And by the time I got into seventh grade, we had an, our own neighborhood school because the white Denver families did not want us bus to their schools. They didn't want Montbello kids in their schools. And this is in Denver, Denver, Colorado, not Denver, Alabama. I don't know if there is a Denver, Alabama, but the bottom line being, you know, she's telling a story about her own life, her own childhood um, as a black girl. And you know, the people who like Joe Biden. I even was just on a text thread, Jason, with some black women who are still mad. And these are black women who are still mad at Kamala Harris for going at Joe Biden like that. Holding it against them because don't, you know, don't mess. Why, why are you trying to take down Joe? Like, that's the attitude even a lot of black people have. I usually thought when you have a debate, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to try to win. Right. Yeah. Supposed, and also you're trying to win. Like, they weren't there to, like, be friends. They were there to win. That's the whole Correct, and and so she's not supposed to what? Is she supposed to like say nice things about Joe? Like it doesn't. That make just any pre-assumes sense. that everybody just thought Joe should be president, so they're just there for window dressing. And should right. not you know interrupt. And, them. Don't mess him up. Don't coronation. mess up Joe. It's a coronation to a lot of people, and so you had a lot of people for whom that was what the point was. And so there were a lot of people who stayed mad at Kamala Harris for that, including apparently Chris Dodd and uh, you know allegedly other people inside of the Biden world. You like stay mad. Some of his you know you know, close, close, close people to him. And and so the thing that I've never understood about this, so, so, so anyway, what Chris, what got out about what Chris Dodd has said to people, apparently including some big donors, is, well, you know, he confronted her about, you know, in, in this course of he's one of the people vetting Joe Biden's, you know, picks for vice president and confronted her about it and that she apparently laughed and said, basically, it's a competition. And that he found that so offensive that this woman, this black woman would dare to defend herself and laugh it off like it's a competition. And I, there were a lot of people on Twitter who when they saw that, they said they hoped that she, you know, put on some very long pointy fake nails and went, oh, <laughs> because you know what? What's she supposed to do? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I was mean to Joe. Like, I that didn't is, want Massa Joe to get mad. Right, so, it's you like, it, hello, it's a competition. She wants to be president of the United States. She's right to be ambitious. Reel back again, similar thing that happened with Stacey Abrams. Stacey Abrams, who initially, when the Biden world let it leak out that he was considering her for VP way before he had won a single primary. Now, again, he had not won a primary. It wasn't clear he was going to even be the nominee. And they let it leak out that he was thinking about, sort of thinking through his choices. And he said, oh, I, you know, I could see myself with Buttigieg as a VP. I could see myself with Stacey Abrams. And then let it leak out that they were meeting up with her to try to talk about it as if they were negotiating in advance, she went on The View and said, I'm nobody's second banana. Like, I'm not here to be that. People held it against her as if how dare she say that she's not willing to be second banana to this white guy. Like, you know, it's just this attitude that women are supposed to just be self-effacing and, you know, buckle down and shrink your shoulders and shrink yourself down. Because if you seem to be too ambitious, it's like the Hillary Clinton thing, right? The, you know, the poison of Hillary Clinton is that she had the nerve to have ambition. But the thing is, I'm sorry, why shouldn't any of these, every single person who's ever been invited, and there's also this third thing, a third thing. There's this rumor that one of the, the things that the Biden vetting team, which does include Chris Dodd and Ed Rendell and some other elderly white male, you know, veterans of democratic politics from a different era, should be raising their grandkids. Who, who maybe, maybe have other things they could be doing, right, that are valuable. They, they want to make sure that the person who's vice president isn't too ambitious and doesn't want to be president. Well, uh, excuse me? I'm pretty sure Joe Biden has wanted to be president for like 50 years, and he's run three times. So when he was put on the ticket with President Obama, 
everybody knew he wanted to be president. Um, it's pretty clear that George Herbert Walker Bush, who had been CIA director and had kept moving up and moving up and moving up as a political figure, when he teamed up with Ronald Reagan, who they couldn't even stand each other. I think everybody understood that after Reagan finished serving, he was going to run for president. I think everyone understood that about every vice president. I think it's called ambition for men. Right, but um, but men can have ambition, but women, it's a it's like a taboo to be ambitious. Ooh, you have to be self effaced you, you know. And so it and, and and you know, looking at every single person that's been named as a potential VP choice, um, Karen Bass was Speaker of the House in California. That's obviously an ambitious woman. She's Chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus. Obviously, she's got ambition. Susan Rice went all the way to UN ambassador. Obviously, she's ambitious. Everyone who gets in politics, I'm pretty sure you could label President Obama, Barack Obama, before he was President Obama, was an ambitious young guy. And they're all ambitious. And so it's just, it makes no sense to me why women are being compartmentalized that they can't be ambitious. So we're not supposed to be ambitious. We're supposed to just be like, I sure do hope somebody comes along and gives me an opportunity. I'm just going to wait over here quietly and wear a nice cute dress. And hopefully if I'm quiet enough and nice enough, and friendly, and I have a nice smile on my face, maybe it'll be okay. Like, that's not the way it works for men. They can be ambitious. Men can be ambitious. I mean, you're ambitious, right, Jason? I would hope so. And you have no shame about that, right? No, not at all. Exactly. And so so the point being that I, I you know, I don't get it. This whole thing that's happening, and it's 2020, and it's just weird, you know, and women are not having it. We have reached an era where, look, women created Black Lives Matter. The three women, the, who cre- the three people who created the Black Lives Matter hashtag in the first place were women. women a woman, a black woman created the Me Too movement. Um, women are doing, like, creating Entire women are movements. seats in the House of Congress. By women the way, are winning everything. I mean, look at this freshman class. It's mo- it's the women that are boss. The, even if you look at the squad, right? The squad that get all of this um, attention. It's Ayanna Presley, Ilhan Omar. Um, it's Rashida Tlaib who just rewon her her primary so that she'll still uh, be in in Congress. Um, AOC. And a, and a Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, AOC. So they're like the stars and Katie Hill, like the people who are the stars in Congress right now are women. Anyway, we're going to talk about women's empowerment today because this is a good day to do that, uh, because this is a good era to do that. We are not far from the election. We're at, on the day we're recording this. We're probably like 80 something days from the election. Uh, it's getting scary. Very scary. Hold on. The polls look good for Biden, but you just never know. And I personally think who he picks as a vice president, you know, and he may have picked it by the time we run this, but we'll see. Uh, I think that will really help him hurt him. All right, let's bring in our guest. Whereas in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for people to dissolve a set of beliefs, biases, and behaviors that fail to recognize the inherent value of one half of the population and perpetuate impediments to achieving all that their God-given rights and talents entitle them to, we proclaim as women who continue to live in a world in which we are undervalued and underrepresented in positions of power relative to men, our declaration of independence from a man's world. Yes, those are the words uh, of the great Jennifer Palmieri. She has a great new book out. The New York Times number one selling uh, author of the book Dear Madam President has a new book out called She Proclaims Former Com- Communications Director both for the President Obama's White House and for the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2016. Jennifer Palmieri, thanks for being here. Hell yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really, I'm really grateful to you. Absolutely. And also I have to let uh, our folks know on the podcast, this is our first podcast the car. Uh, Jennifer is in a car, which is, this is going to be fun because I don't think we've done one. You are the first. And of course, you, uh, you know, we have to have a woman be first. So the, a woman is our first car podcast interview. So I think we can get an applause for that. I didn't, Jason didn't give me an applause. I'm going to get an applause out of Jason. Adam, Woo! So I'm going to get an applause out of okay, There's a lot of firsts for you the first these couple weeks, right? I'm it, really it, honored. It's, it's true. It's very true. It's very true. All right. So let's, uh, let's talk about this book. Um, you wrote this book um, in which you have We Proclaim on the front, crossed out in pink, and it says She Proclaims, damn it. You should have put damn it on there. It needed a damn it. What, why did yeah. you write this book, Jennifer? Well, I did want, you know, we did, actually, we, when we designed the cover, we wanted, because we wanted to be active, right? We want women to say this stuff out loud, which was what was so great to hear you say, uh, to read in the beginning. That's the preamble for our Declaration of Independence, because I think there's so much that women have internalized um, where we 
about how you survive in a man's world, how like we expect to do worse than the men. We accept it that we're like, yay, you're the woman for 2018. All these women are elected to Congress, but it's only 25% women, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, and and I think that we, you know, we've accepted, we tolerate this. We understand that we have to talk like men and dress like men when we come into the workplace. And I wanted to write all this down, make us say it out loud. She proclaimed our Declaration of Independence and force myself to be very specific in the advice that I give women, right? So chapter by chapter is uh, there is a, you know, some kind of resolution where we're saying, because this has been happening, here's what women are going to do yeah. differently. Yeah. You remember the power suit? I don't know. See, I'm, not, I'm not trying to age everybody with me, but uh, I'm making everybody get get to my age. Um, so uh, do you remember the power suit? Are you old enough to remember that? When when the whole idea was that sure. women in the workplace needed to wear like the biggest shoulder pads you could possibly like stand up straight in, right? And you had to have like a power suit and it had to look like this and it had to be like a zoot suit. And like you, it literally was trying to dress like a man, right? It really was. And this is like, you know, this is my sort of first awakening. Not that these points, at some, at some level, these points are obvious, yeah. right? But, but they really have, we have let them define us. But, you know, the Hillary campaign sort of opened my eyes to this. But, you know, one of the things I do, like the second chapter, which, by the way, is called Man's World, We're Just Not That Into You, which is my favorite <laughs> chapter title. But I ask people to imagine how, how, would, how would men feel if women had been in charge from the start, mm -hmm. right? And I think... This can really open up your mind and, and, and how women and men both look at the way women view ourselves in the world. Because if every time a president spoke, you know, all 45 of them had been women, mm. how would men feel about, you know, how would we, when, when a male politician spoke, when we're used to hearing a women's voice, we'd be like, oh my gosh, she's so loud. It's so <laughs> off-putting. Right. God, he sounds like my dad. <laughs> I can't vote for somebody who sounds like my dad, right? right? Yeah. And or if sports, sports is so powerful in our culture. If every week, every Sunday, we all sat around the television set and watched women play soccer and 17 to 1, the voices on country music radio were women's voices over men, right? Yeah. All every day, multiple times a day, women are given the signal that we are not as valuable are as powerful as men. And like, I think it's like having internalized that belief, having been willing to accept scraps. And here's the really, really important thing, Joanne, is we believe we are in competition with other women. Mm. We believe we are in competition of other, you know, marginalized people, people of color for a limited amount of success in a white man's world. And when you think you are in competition, when only a few people can succeed, and if that woman gets in the meeting, it means I don't, you are, the big realization I had is when you do that, you are propping up the very power systems that block all women, all people of color from getting real power. Like I never thought I was a woman operating in a man's world. I was like, that's defeatist. That makes me a victim. That's not me. And what I realized was I got led into the man's world and I've been running it really well for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And that, you know, and for a while I think it was fine to act like, you know, to try to model ourselves after men so we, under, you know, so we had something to hold on to. But, you know, we just keep plateauing and plateauing and plateauing and women aren't getting anywhere. Like you look at the numbers, we're just not, we're not making progress. And I was like, okay, you got to get, we got to get outside of this. Yeah. We got to create our own lane. Following their path has turned into our rut. You know, I got to tell you, Jennifer Palmieri, uh, as far as I know, you've mostly been in politics, but you came here to preach a word this morning. I think you actually <laughs> came here. You came here to preach a word, and it's not even Sunday. Um, listen, <laughs> l let's talk about this. Chapter 11, Ambition. Ooh, you wrote this. Uh, this is prophecy because we are, we are right now, speaking of that, we're in a period right now where the question of whether women ought to be ambitious and whether ambition itself is something um, uh, unwanted, something that is just sort of, you know, eerie and icky to people, like that people get uncomfortable with the idea of women having ambition. You worked for Hillary Clinton, who is kind of the prototype for the way that the world, the media, um, the public, men hate the idea of an ambitious woman. Hillary Clinton obviously was a brilliant first lady, but was told, you know, bake cookies and shut up. And then she tried to like create healthcare and they were like, shut up and stop doing that. And then they were like, 
we don't like your suits. Why are you wearing pants? You should be wearing a skirt. Because first they were like, wear a power suit in the 80s. But with a tiller, it's like, no, why aren't you wearing a dress? Uh, and then it was like, we don't like your hair. We don't like your headband. We don't like the way you comb your hair. We don't like anything about your wardrobe. And then when she decides to run for Senate, it's like, yeah, it's okay because your husband was wrong, didn't, treated you wrong. Maybe that's all right. Can you cry a little bit? Right? I mean, like she literally was the, she kind of has been the archetype for the way that men react to women who are powerful. What did, when and she, you ran her comms direct, her comm, her communications in 2016, did you feel like that was intensified or that over 40 something years it had started to simmer down and you were surprised that it was as strong as it was? I was surprised it was as strong as it was, right? Like I walked into the Hillary distortion field and I had not <laughs> expected that to happen. But as soon as I was like, wait, what is happening? Because, you know, I've worked for her husband. I worked for President Obama. I've like done a lot of politics. I've done been a lot of tough situations, but it was nothing like encount you encounter with her. And you just like sort of when you went through the gamut, Joy, it's like whatever she does, it's the wrong thing, right? Like when her husband... Um, she didn't change her name, right, when they first were married, and that was an issue in Arkansas, and so she changed her name to Clinton, and then, Arkans you know, Arkansans are like, why did you change your name? And she, she says, well, you know what, I, I thought that's what people wanted. She always says, I try to listen, I try not to take criticism personally, but to listen to it and see how I can do better. And what I realized was there was just really not any way around this question of ambition and making voters comfortable with it it seems you know and i should say on the outset like i don't think all men like my experience is men are not trying to hold women back right that is not my experience it's like there are power systems that we all buy into that hold women back but i've had great male mentors great male colleagues and that's not my experience and women you know we hold all these but even in 2020, even in 2016, there's still something a little unusual about a woman with ambition to get the really big job, right? Yeah. When you're running for president of the United States, you're like, I want the biggest job in the world. And that's like, whoa. And that is sort of unnerving, it's confounding. It makes us wonder about the woman and her motivations. We're a little suspicious of her. There's something about her I just don't like, right? How often did we hear that about Hillary? You hear that about, sometimes we hear that said about Kamala Harris Stacey or Abrams. Elizabeth Warren on that campaign show. Elizabeth mm -hmm. Warren. You can go through them all. Stacey Abrams is, still, ooh, that's unseemly. Why is she saying she wants to be VP? Ooh, that's right. unseemly, Kamala yeah. Harris. Too ambitious. Maybe she needs to settle down a little bit. I mean, it's been consistent, right? I mean, yeah. and this is all of these women, white women, black women, Latinas, it's, it's consistent. If you are a woman, you're not supposed to express any desire or any ambition. And I think the only way around it is through it, right? You got to do like what Kirsten Gillibrand did, which I I really admired in her presidential race, where she's like, yes, I want to be the first woman president. That's like what I want. I am running on a pro-woman agenda because I think, hey, more women in office means you have better representation. You might get some better solutions. It's not that radical of a concept. And you know, during the Clinton campaign, we got this crazy advice about Hillary has to express her ambition to wanting to be in service to others. We're like, oh, okay. We're like nodding. Okay, great. Like, what do we say? What do we say? Everything has to be, I want to do this because I want to be in service to others. And I work for the Children's Defense Fund because I want to be in service to others because that's how you can make voters comfortable with her ambition, but, you know, her very frightful ambition. Um, and, you know, in the end, it doesn't work, right? Yeah. In the end, it doesn't work. You just like, so that's why I think now we have to like, proclaim it and celebrate it and celebrating each other like everybody and what's so great about your new show and everyone everyone is it's like we're excited for you but we also feel like it's an accomplishment for all women it's an accomplishment for all women of color and um it's something we share in and like what i've come to realize is women are not our competition they are our support system yes. and more women in power begets more women in power. Um, and when we are all, you know, when you need to be valued for the important work that you do, and that means another woman's gonna be valued for the work that she does. And we are, are, we are linked this way and we haven't acted like it. And um, that's what needs to change now. Absolutely, you write in this chapter uh, 11 ambition, whereas we know that stifling our own ambition to accommodate the expectations of our male dominated society prevents us from living up to our full potential, robs the world of our best efforts and perpetuates the myth that ambition in a woman is an undesirable quality. We proclaim that we will embrace and celebrate our own ambition and ambition in all women. And you know, I think about this as well, and you said it a little bit earlier, and I think I'd love to have you expand on that a little bit. Because sometimes what also happens is that women, 
you know, because everything in America is racialized, right? And so in a lot of ways, white women, black women, women of color, you know, uh, Muslim women are all sectioned off. And also, as you said, it's not necessarily that any individual man has to pit us against each other. Sometimes we're pit against ourselves and like sort of almost trained to like do it ourselves. It's like a self-fulfilling machine that keeps us down. What do you make of the fact that we still don't have um, a broad alignment on the question of ambition over over whether white women versus black women versus you know women of color ought to be the VP? Because this is a big question, right? Um, you know, you had um, you've, you've had a lot of argument over this because you have a lot of black women who say, "Look, black women have propped up the party." Black women, you know, didn't even benefit the most from affirmative action. In the end, white women benefited the most. And there are a lot of black women who feel like if after all of these fights and after all of the struggle, it's a white woman who benefits and becomes the VP. It's a slap in the face to black women. What do you say about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it should be I think it should be a black woman on, on the ticket. And, um, you know, just even like just out of respect, right? <laughs> just out of respect for the agony that we saw this summer um, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, right? You just, um, but the the thing that, the thing that I really want white women to understand and um, written about is we have propped up the patriarchy because <laughs> at moments, as much as I want everybody to bust out of it, right? Um, there are, it has been a refuge, a white male patriarchy has been a refuge and a shelter for white women, obviously in a way that has never been for anybody else, right? So we can want to hold on to our, you know, what I think should be very unsatisfying, hold, you know, perch in a man's world because we're scared about losing it. Um, but when you do that, you know, you gotta look at, you know, you have to look at his, white women need to understand the history here, you need to understand that a white woman falsely accused a man of assaulting her in Tulsa and that started the massacre there. A white woman falsely accused Emmett Till and that led to his murder. And, you know, up to the current day, we're 53 percent of white women voted for Donald Trump and, you know, our central park watcher. Right. Yeah. So it's like you may not be responsible for any one of these um, actions, but you need to know that it's part of our history and like a white woman's legacy and it's why people of color could be suspicious about what how good a white how good of an ally a white woman is going to be so like in this moment it's like by all means we should have a black woman on that ticket and the white women need to understand that it is our role to support her and you know it's going to be tough god loves this poor woman whoever it is right because like she's going to run into the like crazy Trump distortion field. It's yeah. going to be terrible for her, but we need to celebrate. We need to defend her, but we also need to celebrate her because the fact that it's going to be difficult just shows you, it's like commensurate with how important it is, right? Yeah. Like that's how I look at it. Uh, well, um, but you, we got to have black women's backs now. I, I love that. And you know, I don't know if you're watching Mrs. America, but it's so, it's such a great show. I've been trying mm -hmm. to get everybody to watch it. it. It's really great because it does get into those dynamics, even within the feminist movement between a Shirley Chisholm you know, and white women feminists who weren't always behind her and didn't always have her backs. And it's a really interesting sort of, you know, sort of counterplay between, you know, the Gloria Steinems and the Bella Abzugs, particularly Bella Abzug versus um, uh, Shirley Chisholm. It's, it's fascinating because it's digging deeper, as you said, into the racialization, even of the feminist movement. So it's difficult. Totally. It's challenging. For, totally. For and the feminist movement, but like, we're at the point now, like, but like, what you realize is, and this is true, the suffrage movement too, right? Um, in a few days is the 100th anniversary of Tennessee ratifying the 19th Amendment. Um, is that you're making, when you, when you sell out you know, when you sell out uh, uh, black women to protect yourself, again, you're propping it up, right? You're buying into the premise that women, people of color don't actually belong, that it is a white man's world and only a few of us can survive. And that's like why it's so like, we really have to banish from our head any notion that this is not a shared fight, it is a shared fight. 
You know, and I love that. I love that. I love that you um, have this framing, and that the book is 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 here at this time where we are having all of these conversations. You do write about Seneca Falls. You write about that because there is, you know, people forget the history, right? We're about to approach this anniversary um, of suffrage, but it was not an, an an. It's not really an anniversary for Black women because it took another almost hundred years to get, you know, or another sixty-five some odd years to get the right to vote in the in the uh, Voting Rights Act for Black women. But there was this. You know, I just was reading the other night about the Deltas, about the Delta Sigma Theta sorority attempting to join the suffrage movement and wanting to join these marches and being rejected by these women who were fighting to get the rights that the founders gave themselves but didn't give their wives and daughters. They didn't think much of them. They were like, you know, we'll even give enslaved black men the right to vote. And then 50 years later, their wives and daughters still didn't have it, right? Um, but, right. you know, you had a lot of white women in the sort of Elizabeth Cady Stanton world who were like, eh, I don't know about having the black women there. I don't know if Sojourner Truth and those, I don't know if they should really be there. March, maybe y'all could march in the back. You you do address that. You talk about that, that, that dichotomy. Yeah. Yeah, that, um, you know, even even Alice Paul, who was such a, you know, pretty relatively radical uh, woman protester organizer in the early part of the 20th century, you know, even she accepted that black women couldn't couldn't be in their march. Like, there was a, here's like amazing, there was a women's march. There was, yes. it was, at the time, there was, it was the biggest march that had ever been held in Washington. Yep. It was on the it was on an inauguration weekend, which is amazing. Yep. Um, and it was in 1913, and it was the day before Woodrow Wilson was inaugurated, and women came to march for suffrage, and the and it was segregated, and the black women had to march in the back, including Ida B. Wells, who at the time was one of the most famous black women in America, and she was like, hell no, and she just you know she was supposed to be part of the Illinois delegation, and she just came off the sidewalk and joined she and a couple other women joined the march and they you know they integrated it themselves yeah and you know it's it, and he, how ironic is it that you know woodrow wilson next to donald trump he is the most racist modern president right like woodrow wilson was a democratic version of donald trump i mean this guy had a clan he you know he he previewed uh, the film about the clan in the white house um he was a, as racist as it gets and as openly racist as any president I guess really until Donald Trump, it's it's really ironic that there was a march against him too. Um, you don't have to comment. Isn't it? It's crazy, <laughs> right? And he was upset that the, that the women had huge numbers, and he yeah. was worried that that was going to overshadow the news That's of his right. inauguration. It's too perfect. It's too perfect. Yeah, I think that you know I'm trying to find analogs to Donald Trump in history. I think Andrew Jackson, Andrew Johnson, and Woodrow Wilson are the three that are the most like him. Um, just That's to show smart. you, we yeah. had bad presidents before. He's not the only one. What What do you, so this is a call to action. What I love about the book is that it opens with all these declarations, the whereases, and it it really, you know, is meant to be almost like a fight song, right? Like, what 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 are, what are some of the simple steps that, you, that you've written about and that you want women to take to sort of be in coalition? And, and, I, and, I, and I love the fact that you're very open about writing what white women can do to be in coalition. What are some of those steps? Well, it's that, you know, it's great to protest, it's great to vote, but what are you doing in your own life, right? Like in your place, if you, if you, uh, if you work outside the home, you know, do you advocate for other women? Do you advocate for women of color? Do you, do you recruit them to come into your, um, to come into your business? Do you, uh, if you, if you are an older woman, like I am, I'm 53 years old. I have a standing in a workplace to advocate for young women, to advocate for women of color in a way that they may not be able to do themselves. But it's like, what are you doing to advance the cause for all people of color and for all women? And you could do it in all and like a number of facets of your life. And then the other thing you do, it's like the book in one in two words is support women. And that it means yourself too, right? Because a lot of times, and I'm totally guilty of this, of of settling for less money than I should because, oh, I don't want to be a problem. I'm just good that I'm here. And part of my value is Man. the fact that, like, I am such a team player yes. and I'm never going to oh. complain, right? right? And when, I do, when I've been doing that, I have been undercutting other women, you know? Like, they're not going to get paid what they're worth because if I settle for that, that's what right. are they going to get? Isn't that and, the worst? You know, I mean, what is that about? I, I don't understand what that is about the way that women are, 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 are sort of, you know, acculturated. That, that we're weird about asking for money. What yeah, because we've been taught, well, for, well, by the way, hello, like every day, multiple times a day, we're sent all sorts of signals about how we're not valued as much as men, right? right? Like yeah. this is why the United States soccer team, the women's soccer team, which like keeps winning world titles, yeah. has to go to court to get paid 
what they're worth because you know some people are like well you know it's just because you know when women's sports makes as much money it's just the way as men's sports then women can get paid this way it's just how the market's built it's like yes no i i realize that i get that we built the market to value men over women yeah, yes absolutely that's what we have to change that's what we have to change right we are like we're in it now joy right like yeah. we're getting to the root of it like like we don't have anything more to prove women women can do any job in the world um now we have to you know now you've got to get out from under thinking that you have to behave like somebody else or act like somebody else or that you're in competition with others because then we're just perpetuating our second class yeah. status and if anybody doubts that uh, a woman can be a better uh national leader uh than a man two words for you new zealand um what do you what do you make of the fact that the united states is considered you know we're considered the most modern you know uh, country in the world you know we've got all the bells and whistles all the features but you know in you know india has had a woman president israel new zealand the aforementioned new zealand um there are african nations that have had uh, liberia has had a woman what is it about the united states do you think that has prevented us from having a woman Part of it is our system. Um, you know, Hillary's a big believer in that, that for parliamentary systems, it's easier for women to come to power because you select, the party leader is selected by a relatively few number of folks, right? So imagine if we had that here, it would just be the members of Congress that actually selected uh, the leader. And women, when you get to know them personally, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, then they don't get caught up in these sort of tropes. So I mean, Hillary was really, Hillary Clinton, for example, really popular when she was United States Senator. Yep. Um, you could see her colleagues rallying behind her and picking her. And then when you go before the public to become the actual leader of the country, you haven't gone through that like bruising uh, national primary fight where you know women really get like swept up in these kinds of yeah. tropes. So I think that's part of it. And then, you know, there is something like swashbuckling and Western about our culture still that um, makes it, you know, makes it tough for women. And, you know, like, Joy, like we have this problem within our own party, right? You know, Democrats, it, I think partly because Democrats are so sure that they're not sexist and they're not racist, they're blind yes. to all of the inherent biases that are in everybody's head. You got to be really alert for these things. It's so true. Oh, my God. She's preaching a word this morning. Just her first preaching a word this morning. Um, it was afternoon, actually. It's afternoon. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing it is, is afternoon. You no, know, it's, it's wild because the other thing, and I've thought about this a lot, about why there aren't more women, you know, black women, but, you know, white women, too, just in, the, in order to become president. The feeder system for president is typically the Senate and governors. And, and there are yeah. still to this date, there have been no black women governors. That, that means black women are just off that table. I think there might be only two Latina governors. There are very few women governors, period, which is why, yeah. you know, Big Gretch is in the situation. Gretchen Whitmer is now in the conversation, right? Because if you're a woman governor, there's like not that many of you to pick from. And the feeder system is also obviously senators, and we're still underrepresented in the Senate. So we're not in the pipeline. And so I guess the question to you would be, how do you get more women in the political pipeline so that they can be even, you know, on the bench for the presidency? Yeah. I think they are, right? They're this, this is what the thing, the thing, the single thing I find most um, that makes me feel most optimistic about women's future um, is how many women are running for office. And they're not necessarily, and, and they're winning in big numbers too, but what's really important is that they feel that they should run, right? They're not necessarily making a calculation like, well, I can definitely win. They just know that their voice is important and it's needed and they're getting in. And that in terms of where is this country that is made up of these women and then like, where are we headed? How do we feel about ourselves? What do we believe we are capable of? Yeah. Women are answering that question in a really empowering way. And I think they're gonna get, you know, they will be the people that like build that bench you know, mixed metaphors become well, who is on your bench? You, you, you're a campaign veteran. You've done this a lot and you've been in the political game for a while. Who's on your bench? Who do you look at and say, okay, that's the next one. That's good. These, these are the ones that are going to be the one Who, who's on your bench. Um, I, I think the, the women mayors have really impressed me, right? Like, um, uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms, um, uh, uh, 
uh, London Breed in San Francisco, Muriel Bowser in DC, Lori Lightfoot in Chicago. Uh, they're really, I feel like they are, they're really something. And then the freshman women Ooh, yes. um, in Congress, mm -hmm. Ayanna Presley, I just, oh, I love her so much. I love yeah. how she's really representing in a different way, right? And she's so out there about, like, the you know, the stories of the people that she literally represents. Um, Katie Porter, who just, like, again, another woman who just, like, puts it all out there. And, you know, they find whatever lever they have. Congressional hearings, not normally super powerful platforms to communicate with the entire country, and they've managed to do that, right? I think it's so important that, Americans be able to look at Congress and say, oh, I sort of recognize myself. Oh, there's a single mom like me, right? Um, or there's a young woman like me, like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, models for uh, for young women. And like those are the folks that I think are up and coming and cool. No, it's great because, you know, you're seeing, and there's a, just a woman named uh, Ms. Bush who just won um, that seat in Ferguson, you know, that represents Ferguson, Missouri, uh, Corey Bush, and she's brilliant. And I think those are the people who can make a difference because they actually do represent normal people. You can hear the, the beep beep of the car that Jennifer is, is getting out of. <laughs> That's because it, it, it died. It died for a second. It like turned itself off and it had to turn it back on to I love it. not well, die of heat. Well, we've had uh, the dog and cat uh, in the background of our show. Unfortunately, our, 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 our newly departed uh, pet, uh, Turbo, has been in the show. Um, we've had a cat try to run in and start trying to gag because a cat will do that, and they have to cough up a hairball. So we've had all sorts of background noises uh, in the show. So it, it's, it's all a part of the fun. Um, tell is. me what, if somebody reads this book, and I, and I like the fact that it's a quick read. You can actually read it pretty quickly and get uh, you know a, a few sort of you know PowerPoint items out of it of things that will actually empower you um it, was that your goal was your goal to empower women yes. to do to get into politics or what what was your goal in writing the book to empower women like to make us feel like we got this we are not we're not doing anything wrong even though you feel stagnated yeah. and you know that this is all within your own power to change something here are things that you can change in your own mind and that will change that's going to change the world and i think we feel sometimes that it's like all too hard but when you change how you engage in the world you have in fact changed it and i just want to empower women to believe in themselves because i believe in them so much right i believe in them so much so i i love this book uh the book is called she thank you Pro, uh, she proclaims, and it's in big pink letters, and we'll show it to you for the for the YouTubers. Uh, that you, it's it, they, they we crossed out. We proclaim. We put she proclaims. I love the fact that you even talk about why it is okay to cry at work. Because listen, if listen, I did after the 9/11 attacks. I was working in local news, and I sure did. You know, because you you we need to just be women, be ourselves. Don't feel like you have to change who you are. You don't have to change how you dress. You don't have to change who you are. And that is something that Jennifer Palmieri will will give you uh, as a word here. Um, the author of the number one. New York Times bestseller, Dear Madam President, as well. So buy both books. Buy them as a twofer. Uh, Jennifer Palmieri, thank you so much for writing She Proclaims. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Really grateful. So proud. So proud of you and happy for you, too. Yay. Oh, thank you. Yay. Go, girl. Girl power. Girl okay. power. Go, girl go, go, power. Go, 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 girl go. power. Okay. 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 Bye. All right. All right. Bye. <laughs> The book is She Proclaims, Our Declaration of Independence from a Man's World, Jennifer Palmieri. Best-selling, New York Times best-selling Did author. you see that laid-back look she had in that car right there? Oh, she there? was chilling she, in the car. On a, on a film set on top of that, too. So, oh, girl, working. She's working. She went from interview to interview. She's uh, uh, clearly getting a lot done, getting a lot in. She was on the she was on the circus, so you can catch her on the circus. Um, that is what she was filming. Isn't that John Heilman's show? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I, yeah. I, you know, I remember, yeah, yeah. The circus is like, yeah, Heilman. Yeah, that is Heilman. Okay, so um, she was on the set. She was on the set. And so you have, on the back of this book, she got like the bomb uh, blurb. She got a blurb from Christian Gillibrand, one from Ayanna Presley, one from Cecile Richards, one from Valerie Jarrett, one from Connie Britton. Remember the Connie Britton, the actress? And one from Tony Goldwyn, who is president of the United States. He's the president uh, in Scandal. Yes. Tony Goldwyn. And here's a, a fun thing for you. You know who Tony Goldwyn also is? Tony Goldwyn was the bad guy in Ghost. Think That's about right. it. That is him. The bad guy yeah. in Ghost was like the lovely president in Scandal. Who knew? Fitz. 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 That's right. President Fitz, but he was also the bad guy in Ghost. He was yes, he like was. we hated him in Ghost so much that it was hard to get. When I finally realized who that's who he was, I was like, oh my god, that's the bad guy from Ghost. But he was wonderful, and I'll show. I got a chance to meet him at the um, 2016 
um, uh, Democratic National Convention, and he's the nicest guy ever. He's also he's also the heir to he's like the grandson, I guess, of the person who's the Goldwyn in Metro Goldwyn Mayor. So he's actually that Goldwyn. He's the Goldwyn from the Metro Goldwyn Mayor Chapman Goldwyn crew. That's correct. So he is the MGM. He is the G in MGM. He's the he's the you know descendant of that. And so, but, but despite that, despite being both a bad guy and ghost and being the star, for, you know, the president of the United States um, to Kerry Washington and Kerry Washington's boyfriend uh, in Scandal, um, he's also a very, very, very nice man. One of the nicest people ever. All right. Thanks, you guys, for tuning in. Jason's like, I look, yeah, man. I'm like, and uh, yes, move this on. <laughs> he's kind of a hottie it, in the show. I guess what I'm listen, getting to is he's kind of a hottie as fit. I'm okay? waiting for you to he's, get there, I was right? trying to get there in a nice way, but I'm saying he's, he's when I met him in person, I was like, he's kind of fine. You see what I got to do with people? Listen. He's kind of fine. Go ahead and push that notification bell just push to the get about joy. Push the notification bell, and I can tell you who else I think is kind of fly. Mm -hmm. But anyway, push the notification bell. <laughs> Send us some comments. Not about Tony Goldwyn, I'm sure. He has a wife and a whole family. Leave him alone. Um, you can also yeah, Joy, put, in, leave him alone. put in some comments <laughs> as well. Uh, get your notifications so you never miss an episode of What to Read. We have so many great people coming up uh, coming up on the show. But also tell us if you have other books that you want us to pay attention to and interview the authors of. We love books. We love to interview folks. Please subscribe. Subscribe, subscribe to subscribe. us. Not oh, just Joy, one quick note. I just yeah. want to let the viewers know that we're going to kind of slow this down to once a week because you're very busy nowadays and I got a lot going on you got a lot going on so we can't push out the twice that we the two times a week that we promised them but they're gonna be good every single time they come out all right week. once a week we're gonna we're gonna slow you down to once a week because also how fast can you read a book I mean I'm, I'm a slow reader so it takes me a good you know several days to get through a book it takes and, a, and on a top of the fact you got about 10 jobs so I got, I got 10 jobs man, 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 job man all right so we're gonna slow it down um, we're gonna do once a week but you guys are also gonna subscribe so you don't have to it doesn't matter when it is because you will be a subscriber you'll never miss it on YouTube uh, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. on Spotify you'll never miss it anywhere so thank you guys for tuning in and we'll see you on the next what to read, what to read. goodbye Bye, fam goodbye